All right, good morning. So uh, my topic this morning is guest of life. I, um, I like the idea, and I'm sure you've heard it, that your life is God's gift to you, and what you do with it is your gift back to God. Um, we could say also the same thing about our consciousness, that we have each been endowed with our own consciousness, which we have the ability to grow and evolve and shape however we choose. Um, and sometimes we do great things with that, and sometimes, yeah, not so much. <laughs> but it's all here, I believe, for, for our intelligent use. You know, as we grow in consciousness and we have uh, what Ernest Holmes refers to as real, a realization, uh, people we do not even know are lifted because we have lifted our consciousness. We think, well, how is that possible? Because we teach that all minds are connected on the unseen side. So even if you are at home and you pray or you meditate or you do a little studying or you do some affirmations, everyone gets raised up because of that. So, you know, I find this really helpful on days uh, when I get up and it's like, oh, I don't want to practice. I don't want to do this spiritual work. Can't I just stay in bed and turn the electric blanket up to mother and just stay here for the rest of the day, and it's like, no, 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 part of what I have to do, I know, is when I get up and I do my treatment and I affirm and I do all this practice that I do, part of it is because all minds are connected and I know it's good for everybody on the face of the earth. So, and since, you know, we never see, um, uh, well, what I like to say is you never see a U-Haul following a hearse, right? Um, and since that, that is uh, the case, uh, we don't take anything with us except the growth we have in consciousness. You know, all of the material things that we strive for, all the sit-ups, all that stuff that we do. I'm sorry, none of that comes with. But the growth we have in consciousness, absolutely, that stays with us. Um, work on our consciousness is never wasted. I remember probably 35 years ago, one of my first metaphysical spiritual teachers, many of you know Terry Cole Whitaker, I remember her saying to me, are you willing to make an investment in your consciousness? And I said, yeah. And she said, good, because anytime you make an investment in your, co your own consciousness, it's never wasted. And you know, she said that in a way that I could really hear it and I really got it. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's right. How could it possibly be wasted? That just really fit for me. You know, so if we are guests, it's right that we be, I think, well-mannered and gracious receivers of life and gracious givers of life as well. You know, because life is continually giving to us. And so it seems part of the human condition um, uh, that we could all use a little bit of healing. You know, Ernest Holmes says, healing is a revealing of the truth that is already within us. There is a truth within you that is perfect right now. And what we teach in the science of mind is that spirit within everyone is whole and perfect and complete, regardless of what the outer circumstances look like. In spirit, everyone is just fine. There's nothing to heal in spirit. So the truth is, each of us is more spirit than we are a physical body. Right? So our belief is very, very powerful, though. If we believe that we're just a body and we have this little old spirit hanging around somewhere, that's how life will unfold for us. But the bigger truth, I believe, is that we are a spirit who just happens to have a little old body right now. You are, get this. You are this big, infinite, cosmic presence of spirit, and you have a little old body right now. Right? The body is not all of us. You know, in truth, we cannot be separate from God. But because our belief is very powerful, we can think in some situations, in some circumstances, in some relationships that we are separate from God. In other words, God is not in this relationship. God is not in this work. God is not in this situation. You know, so I look at all areas uh, to heal. Uh, I look at all areas that need to be healed as these are like little dark spots in our own consciousness. Places where we have... Um, a false belief. We have some notion about life or ourselves or people. They're, these notions are born from past experience and they've never fully been brought to the light for healing and release. All right? so, so I think that the, the areas we have to heal, that's, that's what they are. And so I would ask us today individually, what areas in your life are you ready to bring to the light for healing and release? Maybe it's something emotional. Maybe it's something more psychological. It could be something physical. Right? So how, uh, how uh, can I say everyone has areas to heal? Um, well, I think if you're here on earth, you probably still have stuff. Right? I, don't know, I don't know anybody who has absolutely no stuff about anything. Do we really know anyone, including ourselves, who, who couldn't use a little more love or a little more light in their lives? 
You know, are, are there people with, with no stuff whatsoever? I think if there are, they have moved on to the next experience, okay? Uh, see, the kind, uh, I think that kind of arrogance, you know, and spiritual pride is going to get us into a lot of trouble. You know, in Proverbs, it says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And it's like, hmm, wow. So it was actually St. George who said, the seven deadly sins are pride, lust, sloth, envy, anger, covetousness, and gluttony. So some years back, one of the uh, Gourmets for God, a dinner that we hosted, was uh, based on the seven deadly sins. Uh, it was a huge hit, if I do say so myself. And I invited people to dress as their favorite sin. <laughs> Yes, you can imagine. It was quite an evening, I'm here to tell you. Um, but in science of mind, you know, we don't believe in sin in a traditional way. We believe that a sin is an error. You've just missed the mark. It's a mistake. And that happens to us again and again on our spiritual journey. We miss the mark and go, oh, I should have done better. Oh, I could have done better. Oh, I wished I'd been uh, more patient or more kind or more loving there. So missing the mark, I think we, we distort the gift that life has been given uh, uh, that life has been giving to us. You know, I think we miss the mark with an error in our own thinking or an error in our behavior and go, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I wished I'd done this instead, you know, or uh, in, in perhaps in a relationship. So a sin, right, theref uh, can therefore be deadly because it often diminishes the person's potential of living a life of greater peace and greater joy and greater happiness and fulfillment and abundance and on and on and on. So the seven deadly sins are seven common ways people may deaden themselves to life's goodness. And so we're just going to run through them, and you see if, if you're attached to any of these. And the thing you want to notice is, gee, am I, am I in that area, and is it deadening me to the goodness that life is trying to present me with all the time? So the first one is pride, obviously, you know, an inordinate uh, perception of oneself. We say it's egotism, that you are more special and more important than others. And that trap is really arrogance, right? So yes, you have the fullness and the allness of God within you right now. But so does everyone else. So there's nothing to be prideful about. Moving on. Lust. <laughs> Lust, excessive desire directed toward selfish purposes, which can lead to useless, unnecessary pain and suffering. Do we really need to say any more about this? Let's not. Uh, move on to <laughs> sloth. Isn't that a great word, sloth? Oh my God, it's, it's just, it's just, what a word, sloth. So basically it's laziness, you know? Now I realize everybody's gotta have downtime, but sloth is different. There's an English proverb that says, laziness travels so slowly that poverty soon overtakes it. <laughs> mm, yeah, so uh, this prevents us from finding greater meaning in our life, I believe, because it blocks um, creativity and productivity and all of those wonderful things. Envy. Envy is an interesting one. You know, feelings of, of discontent because of another's advantages. You know, when, when, they, um, when that discontent becomes resentment and we don't uh, enjoy other aspects of life, that's really a problem. Now, the fact is when we see somebody who has something that we would like, the appropriate metaphysical spiritual response is, that's for me, not why them, why not me? that never brings any greater good into our life. The thing is, you see somebody who's doing well and you say, wow, that's fantastic, that's for me. Universe, I'm open to that as well. Anger, well, you know, we all understand when anger can become a crippling emotion. It destroys uh, communication and relationships, you know, and it often leads to really, really destructive behavior. Uh, covetousness, which is greed also, you know, it's, it's in opposition to the natural abundant flow of life. You know, this, uh, this is excessive desire directed towards selfish purposes, I'm talking about, and gluttony. You know, anything we do to excess, uh, such as you know, physical addictions or other important aspects of life go unignored. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's damaging. You know, so moderation is the key if you can do that. Now, myself, I've never been particularly good with moderation. I've always thought that if some was good, a lot's better. And, uh, but I will tell you that I know there are people who can do it. When I came to the church uh, many years ago, there was a little elderly woman here. I think I can say that. She's passed on now, and she's not judging me. Um, she, was, she was 95. She was 95, and she was here every Sunday, and she looked like a million bucks. 
You know, she always had her little high heels on and her purse that matched her shoes and her hair was done and she was always dressed beautifully. Her name was Shirley and I'd say, Shirley, tell me your secret, tell me your secret. I said, you're such an inspiration. And she'd, and very humbly she'd just say, Reverend Mark, I do everything in moderation. And I'd scrunch up my face, you know, like a moderation, what is that? Oh my God, that just gives me a headache to think about it. And her daughter would say, it's true, she does. Mom does everything, she eats and drinks everything. We go out every Saturday night for dinner, mom orders the best stuff on the menu and immediately she puts half of it in the box. She always orders dessert, half of it in a box. She has a glass of wine, but never ever have I known her to have more than one glass of wine. You know, I said, wow, that is something to aspire to. And she'd say, I do everything in moderation. And I thought, well, that is clearly gonna be my assignment for another lifetime. <laughs> because, um, because I just didn't get that this time around. If some is good, a lot more is better, is how I've been. But, uh, but well, I still think I'm learning. I still think I'm learning there. So, um, so the thing is, we want to be aware. We don't want to be deadening ourselves with any of these things to, to the point of missing the goodness of life. See, I think we all have blocks and limitations to the free flow of the forces of God in our life. And I think of it as, as a wall that's, say, in front of our heart. And because of that wall that's in front of our heart, love cannot express freely. Uh, and it can't come to us either. So science of mind says your belief that you are separate from God in some area, that's the problem. So Ernest Holmes says in our textbook that a realization of the presence of God is the most powerful healing agency of which humanity is aware. The most powerful healing agency is to have a realization of the presence of God within you as you. So the human mind wants to justify. You know, the human mind wants to argue for problems, you know, to build a case for my problem. My problem is real. My problem is really special. You don't understand my family, my background, my limitations, what I have been through, on and on and on. So the human mind sees great power in the external conditions, right? And say, wow, this is big. This is gonna take years for me to heal. Well, if you think so. If you think so, I'm sure that will be the case for you. But my suggestion is one, make God bigger than your problem. And we can all do that right now. However big your God is, get a bigger God if you've got a problem that you think is insurmountable, right? And the second piece of this is, you are one with God. Ernest Holmes teaches this. This is our message in the science of mind, that we are one with God. So I must say part of this is because we believe more in our humanness than in the divinity that we are. Uh, that more in our humanness than we are spirit. More in our humanness than our oneness with God. And so that, again and again, for all of us, I believe, causes problems. You know, it, start, it started with Adam and Eve back in the garden. I mean, if you think about it, Adam and Eve, now this, of course, is a metaphor. We don't really think there was a garden or an Adam or an Eve. But just for the sake of the story, for the metaphor, here they are. They're in paradise. They're in a garden. Everything is perfect. Everything is provided. All they know is our needs are met. Life is good, right? But then, then they slip into this idea of separation. They eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. See, up until that point, everything was hunky-dory. Everything was good. But now, good and evil, there's separation. It's not just one. And so it goes downhill from there. Now, ultimately, I think this was good because this is very important for humanity as a whole to be able to choose to evolve and grow. So the solution you know, is, you know, the salvation is not to be found in the world. Lots of things contribute to being separate from God. You know, lots of things, it's just like if we're dealing with a physical illness, lots of things contribute to that. It's complicated. Everyone's journey, I believe, is complicated. We have to go up in consciousness to solve the problem. You know, if I, if, if I can oversimplify, one problem, one, uh, well, well, that one problem is that we're separate from God. So how does God see us? So imagine this, the intelligent, creative force of the universe, the architect of the universe, looks at each one of us and sees us as pure love, sees us as spirit, sees us whole and perfect and complete. Error has never attached itself to our true selves. So we know things, you know, cooking consciousness for a long time before they show up out here on the physical plane. We understand that, you know. So the deal is to recognize I've got to save myself from my own worst enemy, you know, which is my own mind used against me. 
right? That I don't know about you, but I have had the capacity to be powerfully negative, to hold myself back, to put myself down, to say horrible things to myself. See, that's the enemy. That's our own worst enemy, and that's what we have to get a handle on, I believe. This is why we're science of mind. The science of using my mind correctly to express more, uh, more God and less error. That's what the science of the science of mind is, right? Uh, what we believe in is true for us. What we believe in has power over us. The problem is not God. God is never, ever the problem. The collective human consciousness, well, that can be interesting. You know, whether we call it the carnal mind or the mortal mind or universal belief in two powers. But any effect on earth that is not love, let us be very, very clear right now, that was not created by God. You know? uh, convince your mind that error, illness, lack, they have no part of the divine plan for you or for me. You just look at that and say, well, that does not belong to me. This does not belong to me. You know, so often I hear people say, oh, I have this, uh, my, my arthritis, my this, my that. And I think, why do you claim that? Why would we do that? That is completely unmetaphysical. You know, to be thinking about my, 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 because every time you say my, my arthritis, my back pain, my whatever, you're telling the universe that belongs to you. You know, and what you want to say is, this does not belong to me. This appearance, this condition, it is not mine. I do not accept it. It does not come from God. So if you want to be in the pool of great consciousness, you have to get in the water repeatedly, I believe. And the way we do that is, you know, read the textbook, treat every day, affirm, visualize, you know, uh, look at the, read the scriptures, listen to words of truth. If you write, you know, uh, if you were a writer, and you want to become a great writer, you have to read great writers. Doesn't that make sense? You'd read you know, Shakespeare and Joyce and Moliere, and you'd read different ones. If, if you wanted to be a great singer, you would listen to other great singers. If you wanted to be a great musician, you'd listen to our great musicians. You know? Right? So, and so for us, if we're desirous of healing, it's important to read about other people's healings because it shows us what's possible. If you want to be a success, read the stories of other people who've succeeded in your field. You know, I think the greats just access the potential that is within them. And what I believe is that we all have that exact same potential within us. You know, and so we must be gracious guests of life and make the most of all of it. Let's pray. Thank you. So we turn our attention inward for a moment and just remember that we are surrounded and filled with an infinite loving presence that we call God. It's spirit, it's truth, it's love, it's abundance, it's harmony, it's creativity. It's all of those qualities. And all of those qualities are the truth about each and every one of us. And I further know that we are all connected on the unseen side of life. That in the mind, in the heart of God, we are all one. And so I speak this word for each and every one of us, that we are absolutely making the most of life's journey, that whatever it is that's up for us to heal, we have a God that is so much bigger than the seeming problem. And so I know that that problem is absolutely dissolved, released, and let go for each and every one of us, never to return. The way is made clear for greater life and greater love and greater health and greater abundance. I claim this is so. And we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children, all of our loved ones, whoever we hold near and dear in our heart today. And we know that right where they are, God is in its fullness, healing, blessing, restoring, renewing. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So all of those things that pull at our attention, all of those situations, we say God is right there as peace, as healing, as right action, as all needs met for all people everywhere. We bless our church and we bless all churches. We bless synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. Because I know we're all connected on the unseen side of life. There are so many paths to God because God's the only place to go. And I know we all are there. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word. And so it is. Together we all say, 